Good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining the Help H webinar on older people and food fuel and the finance crisis. Um, we're just going to wait a couple of minutes to get started uh, while we give a few more minutes for people to join. All right. Well, welcome everyone to the Help Age webinar. Um, my name is Shannon Ducey, and I'm going to be moderating the webinar. Um, and I thought I would just begin with um, a brief introduction of, of the outline of the program for today. Um, so in today's session, we're going to be focusing on the impacts of the recent combined crisis related to rising food costs, rising fuel costs, and how this has impacted on the basic needs and rights of older people. Um, so we've seen very much over the past several years that the cost of living has increased sharply throughout the world, and this has really had huge implications for hunger and poverty, and in particular among older adults because of their um, more limited economic opportunities. So as we all know and have seen evolving since COVID um, first and then the impact of Ukraine and the food export crisis, along with climate change and existing um, challenges related to poverty and inequality, as well as the increasing number and impacts of humanitarian emergencies, livelihoods have been greatly impacted, um, and in particular, among older people in lower and middle income countries, we've seen a huge increase in vulnerability. Um, Help Age focuses in particular on this group and has really been making a strong effort over the past several years to look at what the impacts of the financial crises and the combined um, kind of co-emergencies have had on older adults. And in this webinar, we're going to be focusing on the findings of their research and what the implications are for um, policy and programming and how um, we as a humanitarian community can move to better support older adults um, and their resilience in both the near and long term. Next slide, please. So the structure of the session today is first we're going to have a brief panel where you'll hear from speakers from five different um, help age programs. And then we will move to a open discussion uh, where we'll be addressing the audience questions um, around programming uh, that help age has been doing and the findings of their research. Next slide, please. So our panelists um, for today are Bob Babjanian. He is the Income Security and Portfolio Lead at HelpAge International um, and has been doing a lot of work in the field of social protection um, and income security globally. Um, in addition, we'll be hearing from several different HelpAge country offices and HelpAge partners. Um, so we'll have the HelpAge country director from Ethiopia, Tardoros Belichu, will be presenting on the experience in Ethiopia. We will have the head of programs from HelpAge Sri Lanka, Chiminda De Silva, who will be presenting on findings from the HelpAge Sri Lanka program. And in addition, we will have Help Age partner organizations represented as well. Uh, the first will be Emily Berdico, who is the director of the Coalition of Services for the Elderly. Uh, she will be presenting, um, as well as Andrew Kavala, who is the executive director for the Malawi Network for Older Persons Organizations. 
And then my name is Shannon Ducey. I am faculty at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health and also the Center for Humanitarian Health. And I will be uh, facilitating and moderating the uh, session for today. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to our first speaker, Bob Bajanian. And before he gets started, I would like to encourage everyone, if you have questions and answers, to type them into the chat box. We will be having moderators that will be um, working behind the scenes to help address some of your questions um, if they're easy to address. And then during the question and answer session, we'll also be addressing audience questions as well directly. Um, so please do go ahead and and, and type in your questions. And we will be taking questions for all of the different presentations um, and then answering them in a combined discussion session following the, uh, the brief presentations. Um, so without further ado, over to you, Bob. Um, hello, everybody. Um, my name is Bob Babajanian. Um, Shannon, thank you very much for your introduction. And I would also like to thank socialprotection.org for hosting our webinar today. So today, um, I will present the findings of our research in 10 countries. Um, and I will talk about the impact of the food, fuel, and finance crisis on all the people's food security, livelihoods, and health. I will also talk about how access to social protection had implications um, on how different groups of all the people experienced um, the impact of the food and fuel finance crisis. Um, I will then draw policy implications. So the research uh, was carried out by HealthAge and its partners in 10 countries in different parts of the world. We had research teams in Asia, Middle East, uh, Latin America, and Sub-Saharan Africa. And the aim of this research was to examine the effects of the food and fuel finance crisis on all the people's well-being. Now, the results of this research have been uh, synthesized in the report um, that I've, I've, um, I have a link to this report here, and I encourage everybody to um, take a look at this report for a more detailed discussion of the impact. So today I will present a summary of key findings. Now, Shannon has already talked about the crisis and uh, what I would like to do is just to stress that the, the crisis involved um, a sharp increase in food prices for uh, prices for food, fuel, fertilizers, as well as a drastic fall in average household incomes. Now, the problem is that the crisis is not far from over. Now, as of July this year, um, domestic food price inflation remains high according to the World Bank, and that's globally. Furthermore, um, Russia's recent suspension of the Black Sea grain deal is likely to increase the uh, prices for basic food commodities from 10 to 15 percent, according to the, the International Monetary Fund's uh, forecast. And we already hear alarm bells coming from East Africa, mostly countries who are reliant on agricultural um, imports for their livelihoods. So the problem is that the crisis that has started in 2022, just after COVID has, has, has started to ease, uh, the crisis is still with us. And we're not even talking about the recovery, where we're talking about a phase where people are still um, coping with the actual uh, presence of the, the shocks and stresses in, in, their, in their lives. Now, let's talk about the consequences for all the people. Now, according to the uh, the food, pro food program, the, this crisis has um, increased the number of people with acute food insecurity as well as at risk of acute food insecurity for, from 135 million in 2019 to 345 million this year. So that is huge. Uh, and the World Food Program considers this as a, a crisis, a hunger crisis of unprecedented proportion. Now, what we're concerned about is the specific impact of the crisis on all the pe people's well-being. Um, and the primary motivation uh, before doing this, this research was that we do know from evidence that all the people are especially vulnerable to shocks and stresses. And this includes shocks related to 
um, climate related events, uh, conflict and violence, as well as um, economic distress. And, and obviously the factors that heighten their vulnerability um, and reduce their resilience include um, gender, existing levels of poverty, uh, discrimination people face across their life, life course, um, health, as well as extent of disability. So all these factors that, um, the intersecting factors that affect how all the people experience crisis and how they cope with crisis. And we, 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 we documented evidence of how these different factors interact in the lives and livelihoods of all the people in our research countries. Now, let me summarize some of the key findings. Now, one key um, finding that is shared across all 10 countries was the um, extremely negative impact on all the people's food security and nutrition. Now, uh, the most common coping strategies that were documented across all countries included restricting the number of meals people ate per, per day, um, consuming less expensive food, that meant less nutritional food, excluding meat from their diet, um, as well as reducing meal portions uh, in order for other family members to have more, for example, grandchildren, or simply because there wasn't enough food in the household. Now, we also um, documented instances of um, asset sale, um, borrowing food, um, as well as in some instances begging for food in, 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 in the households where individuals were not resorting to such coping strategies before. Now, the effects are gender, but what we found is that there's higher share of all the women who experience more acute food security and malnutrition than men. Now, obviously, both men are, and women are um, affected, but women are affected more. And this finding comes through qualitative studies, but also through quantitative and dietary diversity score findings in three countries in Africa. Now, all of this has serious implications for all the people's health and uh, well-being um, as we speak. But it also has implications for their resilience in the long term. It erodes their resilience and their ability to cope with, with, with future uh, shocks and stresses. Now, just to continue on, on this issue of food security uh, and security, um, I would like to uh, highlight some of the drivers of food insecurity. And these are the, the in intersecting impacts of rising food prices, as I mentioned, falling household incomes, as well as the, the difficulty to produce enough food. Now, in most countries of our research, all the people largely rely on markets to, uh, to procure food they need. So they, they would buy food on the market, but um, the, 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 the rising prices meant that they could no longer afford buying the, the normal, the usual quantities and types of food they would do before the crisis. Now, another problem, and, and this is a huge uh, challenge, um, and, and, and a huge driver of their food insecurity was that they did not, most people who we found experiencing acute food insecurity lacked access to social protection and other alternative forms of income. Now, this is an important finding and, and it shows that in times of crisis, social, social protection provides an informal safety net that people, uh, an important safety net that people can, can rely on, can draw resources and, and, and that strengthens their ability to cope with shocks and stresses. Now, what we also saw was that there were other factors that were amplifying the effects of the, uh, the, 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 food, uh, the food crisis, and those include climate change as well as conflict. So they, they intensified the, the experiences of people, they intensified the negative effect of impact by through various pathways by disrupting food production, by limiting access to markets and undermining people's, all the people's resilience by eroding their savings, eroding their health, their ability to produce food and uh, derive income. Now, um, let me talk a little bit about livelihoods. And so for, for those other people who are actually before uh, used to produce food in, uh, through agriculture production or raising livestock, um, the crisis meant that it's become increasingly more difficult to do so, uh, partly because of the rising high cost of um, agricultural inputs, but also because of the climate change events, as I said, that inter intervened into these processes and made it more difficult for pe people to, um, to cultivate land, for example, 
um, in Mozambique or the conflict in Ethiopia that prevented people from um, important sources of livelihoods and markets. Now, less income from livestock and agriculture production meant that people had more limited income, uh, more limited ability to generate income from, um, from these kind of activities. Um, we also observe instances where the, those individuals who used to take loans, who had loans um, and use them up for productive activities, the, the interest the rates on loans become so high that they were no longer sustainable and, and all the people were absolutely um, scared of falling into debt because their inability to, to repay those loans. And we also observe instances of rising debt and loss of assets in some countries such as Yemen. Now, there was also negative impact on all people's health, all the people's health, and, and that impact has manifested in different ways. We, we documented increased household expenditure in some countries such as Tanzania. We saw rise in the cost of medicines in Malawi, Lebanon, uh, but also reduced supply of medicines in some countries uh, such as Mozambique, Sri Lanka, Philippines, where the impact was due to the breakdown in the supply chains um, but that was that was triggered by the COVID pandemic. Now, uh, that, the, 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 the crisis also meant there was reduced access to some healthcare facilities um, and some social services that people were reliant, all the people were reliant on because of the rising cost of transport, uh, but also a reduced provision of home, home based home care services because of the difficulty to, to afford um, fuel and transport to, to, to drive to, the, uh, to reach the areas that are, we're providing such support. And we, we documented the detrimental effects on uh, all the people's mental and emotional well-being. Uh, and these effects came mainly through different channels, from, so, from the feeling of dependency and embarrassment because they couldn't, um, they couldn't uh, generate income to sustain themselves and their own needs, and they become reliant on, entirely reliant on their families and households and on their communities and neighbors for those for the people who, who were single, who lived alone and didn't have an extended family to fall back on. Um, but we also saw a feeling of loneliness and isolation because the, the rising cost implied that there, were, there was less ability to invest in ceremonial activities to buy gifts, to share food with neighbors, friends, and communities. So the impact had been manifold. Now, again, let me go back to the issue of social protection. And, 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 and this is very important because what we saw, we saw a larger share of all the people in the study, a large share of people did not have um, effective access to social protection. Uh, and this is because um, many countries in the world have only limited coverage uh, because of um, prevalence of contributory pensions, they only provide uh, benefits for those employed in the formal economy, and this only this is only a smaller share of, of all the people. Now, other countries who provide um, cash transfers, as so, so-called social pensions, that are uh, not contributory pensions to so those who, uh, who who work outside the, the formal um, economy. Uh, they only provide limited schemes. So countries like Philippines, Mozambique, Colombia, they provide limited schemes. They are mostly means tested. Uh, they're poverty targeted, um, and they do not cover the entire uh, population of all the people. We also saw that the, 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 the countries where, say, uh, Argentina, Colombia, where there was a, a higher coverage than in some other countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, for example. So the people who receive pensions the amounts were so small that they were easily eaten up by their current um, uh, uh, expenses and there was very little to spend on, on food that, uh, was of, um, uh, uh, that, that was extremely unaffordable. So let me illustrate this through these figures. You can see from this uh, figure that, I, that is based on the ILO um, data, uh, as you can see, the, the extent of social protection coverage of all the people in the countries of this research, uh, as you can see, in some countries, the coverage is, um, is very, very small indeed. Countries like uh, Yemen, Malawi, Tanzania, Ethiopia, these are mostly um, uh, schemes, uh, contributory schemes that cover 
of workers in the formal economy. Um, and uh, countries with slightly higher coverage, such as Argentina, Colombia, um, and Mozambique, you have a mix of contributory and non-contributory. But again, even here, you can see that um, maybe with the exception of Argentina, you have uh, at least half of the population, uh, half of the, the, the population of the people remains without social protection coverage. Now, what are the implications of all of this? Now, um, Obviously, as I said, so the immediate livelihoods of all the peoples are, are, are of all the people are threatened. So therefore, emergency assistance is important, and it's important to reach out to them and provide um, provide immediate support. And this is important. Not uh, it's important to stress this because what we know, what HelpEdge has learned throughout years of experience, is that all the people are often neglected, even in humanitarian responses that are meant to. Uh, provide assistance to the population affected more generally without targeting all the people, without considering specific vulnerabilities they have, without specific, uh, without considering the needs and constraints they experience. So, uh, so for the first, uh, the first implication is that um, emergency support is important and such support needs to be specifically tailored to the needs and constraints of all the people. More importantly, or equally importantly, we also need to think about more sustainable ways of supporting all the people and therefore promoting social protection for all as a basic right is absolutely essential. Now, uh, this means extending coverage and ensure that um, there, there, there is this gradual incremental uh, expansion in coverage as a way of reaching a, uh, the, the end goal of covering the entire population uh, um, of all the older people. Now we do hear a lot about the the importance of uh, adaptive and shock responsive social protection, uh, and this is indeed something that uh, many countries and many international organisations, governments, and donors are preoccupied with. We also know from our experience that there's very little attention to all the people in the effort to develop shock responsive mechanisms within social protection systems. Therefore, one of the key recommendations of HelpAge is to ensure that all the people are explicitly recognized in developing shock responsive mechanisms. Now, there is a challenge here. You cannot develop effective shock responsive measures if you have limited coverage. In other words, if your older people are, uh, are overlooked by social protection systems, then obviously there, there, is no, there, there is no institutional foundation for developing those adaptive shock responsive measures. So therefore, again, we're going back to the, the need, the foundational need to, to extend coverage as a, as a basic precondition to effective shock responsive social protection. And finally, as I said, um, the importance of uh, understanding, recognizing, identifying the, the differences in all the people's lives, experiences, needs, constraints is paramount. People, all the people uh, with disabilities are different in their needs and constraints from all the people Without disabilities, gender has an important effect, ethnicity, refugee status, and so on. Um, and therefore, in our understanding programming and policy development, um, it is important to not only um, focus on all the people as a group, but also uh, identify specific vulnerabilities and weave, uh, weave specific institutional mechanisms to address those in two programs and uh, policy interventions. So um, that's all I have for this presentation. Thank you very much. Um, and I am going to now um, uh, pass it back to Shannon um, and she can, she can initiate the panel discussion now. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, Bob, for that overview. Um, I am going to first introduce some of our different panelists um, and then give quickly the opportunity, I think, to hear from each of them. Um, so first, we're going to move to Ethiopia, uh, where we'll hear from Tedoros Balichu, who's Help Asia's country director. Okay. Uh, thank you, Shannon. Uh, uh, hello, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. This is uh, Theodorus, uh, Country Director for HelpAge International in Ethiopia. Ethiopia is uh, located in the Horn of Africa, 
It's also the capital seat for the African Union. Uh, I look forward to engaging with you all. Wonderful. And then next, uh, we have Chiminda De Silva from Help Age Sri Lanka, who is the head of programs. And maybe also we would like to remind everyone that um, you can share your your questions um, in the in the chat if you have panels. Um, one of the questions I have for for uh, regarding Sri Lanka is considering the um, really critical changes there in rising prices and I think inflation that we've seen almost higher anywhere um, than in the world and the issues related to broken value chains. Um, could you just discuss a little bit about what the specific situation of older people in, in Sri Lanka, uh, uh, or sorry, in, in Ethiopia is? Um, and then maybe a little bit about um, how older people have been affected by the crisis. I think one of the things I noted from Bob's slides too was the very low coverage of social protection programming in Ethiopia for older adults um, and, and how that really has impacted um, the outcomes there. Yeah, thank you uh, again, Shannon. Uh, thank you, Bob, actually, for the wonderful uh, presentation. Yeah, it says a lot about the situation of uh, older people in uh, those countries. Uh, just to say a few words, this uh, the study, the 3F study, uncovered uh, the desperate situation of uh, older people in Ethiopia. Uh, and uh, obviously, older people in Ethiopia are uh, facing intersecting inequalities. Uh, exacerbated by overlapping shocks, such as uh, the COVID crisis, the Ukraine-Russia war, as well as uh, the uh, conflict and intercommunal conflict, as well as uh, kind of ethnic conflict uh, in the country, and also uh, drought or uh, climate shock. So uh, uh, this study also revealed that 87% of older people uh, in Ethiopia reported to you know decline in quantity and diversity of food consumed due to uh, this global and uh, national crisis. And we have also uh, findings that you know like half of half of older people are skipping meal even for a day. So uh, you can imagine the level of uh, uh, crisis or the desperate situation uh, they are facing. And we also did the additional uh, assessment in one of the drought affected community. And uh, it also revealed that uh, 80 or 90% of older people have no access to safe water. And also they don't have uh, enough income. And um, we did some additional assessment to see the uh, uh, nutrition status of older people. And uh, it revealed that uh, half of older people uh, found to have, you know, uh, either moderate or severe uh, uh, malnutrition. Uh, so it needs really uh, urgent uh, intervention. So uh, in general, in general, because of uh, multiple uh, crises and compounding factors, uh, more than 75% of older people are living uh, below poverty line. And there is no um, a specific older people policy in the country. And there is a social protection policy, which we think address some of the uh, needs and priorities of uh, older people, whereas uh, the policy by itself also uh, is really not comprehensive, it's not inclusive, and also uh, it's not age sensitive. So uh, it's it's uh, really uh, uh, 
unfunded and there is no uh, sustainable uh, model to you know uh, sustain this policy and there is also there is no uh, when governing body you know to uh, properly uh, ensure the implementation of uh, this uh, uh, social protection policy so um, so cu cu currently there are two major uh, uh, programs or schemes uh, under this uh, social protection policy uh, as Bob mentioned one is a uh, 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 pension scheme and the other is a productive safety net program we believe both are uh, pro poor uh, programs however when we see the uh, coverage uh, of uh, older people in those uh, pro poor uh, programs uh, in Ethiopia, the pension scheme is more of contributory. So uh, initially, it was only for uh, people who have passed through the public uh, domain or the uh, employed by the uh, government. And now there is a further extension to uh, private sector. However, the enrollment of older people uh, is really uh, very, very low. Only 7% uh, of older people are covered by either the uh, 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 public sector pension or private sector uh, pension. So this figure is even worse, very, very uh, low for women, uh, about only 1.5% of uh, uh, older women are covered by this uh, pension scheme. And uh, when you come to the uh, productive safety net program, this is uh, really a pro poor program. So uh, still only 7.2% of uh, older people are uh, covered by this uh, productive safety net program. So it's not, we can see it's not really inclusive, it's not really age sensitive and uh, only very, very uh, small portion of uh, older people are uh, benefited uh, by uh, such a program. So uh, the national uh, constitution actually pronounced willingness to you know, allocate resources for older people and other vulnerable groups. And uh, this policy, the social protection policy is also, you know, it recognizes it as a core public policy to address poverty, vulnerability, and uh, inequality of uh, older people. Whereas when we see the implementation or the practical aspect of uh, this policy and these uh, initiatives, uh, we can say it's far from you know uh, being realized. So uh, it's very important to make you know this uh, uh, social protection schemes, especially the uh, safety net program to be, uh, uh, you know, older people have to be enrolled without any precondition. Uh, so it has to be uh, age sensitive. All women and men have to be uh, part of uh, uh, such safety net programs. And also uh, the pension scheme has to be, you know, uh, uh, inclusive of uh, all uh, vulnerable groups specifically the older people we are advocating you know to uh, include all older people without any precondition in national uh, pension scheme and there are uh, actually uh, strategies or tools that we believe are critical to uh, make this happen one is uh, uh, social security council establishment of the social security council or the governing authority for uh, social protection uh, programs and also uh, a funding scheme, a pooled funding scheme to sustain uh, such programs. So uh, there is uh, little appetite, of course, by the government to, uh, you know, uh, to make these uh, uh, initiatives uh, practical on the ground. So uh, thank you uh, very much, Shannon. I can say also a few words about, you know, how this uh, humanitarian crisis are addressed by uh, uh, development and humanitarian communities. Uh, 
as I can, as I have already said, you know, uh, the needs and priorities of uh, older people are often overlooked uh, from uh, uh, humanitarian response, and they are uh, or, or excluded. And uh, most of the humanitarian need assessments and also plans doesn't uh, include older people in the consultation process, and also they don't engage them. Uh, during the uh, review process and help aid reviewed about 11 uh, need overviews and country plans and only three of them found to uh, include you know older people in all those process so if they are not counted or included during the uh, review and assessment process there is no way to account them to during the uh, response process so in general the current architecture is uh, more of like uh, a blanket approach which doesn't uh, recognize the uh, specific needs of uh, older people older men and women and uh, other uh, vulnerable groups and uh, uh, older people obviously have less access to humanitarian response because of uh, various barriers and we need to remove all those barriers and in um, in idps in refugee context uh, we realized you know most of the service the response are not really friendly for older people and uh, they don't know even how to include older people in all of those response and uh, some of the situations they live are really desperate and we really uh, advocate for uh, short term mid term and uh, long term uh, solutions to overcome uh, uh, such challenge and also properly address the needs and priorities of uh, older people. And it's very important to uh, consider uh, immediate food and cash and other comprehensive uh, humanitarian assistance for older people. And uh, in the midterm, of course, it's also uh, important to consider uh, diverse alternative income source to sustainably support uh, older people. And uh, of course, the government has to consider some uh, subsidies in consumer products, uh, as well as agricultural products, such as uh, uh, seeds and fertilizers, and also engage older people in uh, drought response initiatives and also the risk mitigation and uh, adaptation uh, programs. And even, you know, conflict is one of the uh, 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 major contributing factor for multifaceted crisis in the country. So older people have a lot to play in the uh, peace and uh, reconciliation process. So we believe they have to be uh, well engaged and uh, consulted and involved and their voice has to be uh, heard if we uh, have to realize uh, a just and inclusive uh, world and programming in general. Thank you, over to you, Sharon. Thank you very much, Sidoros. I think that was a really nice comprehensive overview of the challenges in Ethiopia. I was really struck by both what you mentioned about the high rates of acute malnutrition in over older adults, as well as the very low coverage of the social protection programming. And I think that the Help Age efforts to really promote inclusive policy um, are very important, but it sounds like you're, you're facing really big challenges there. Um, in the interest of time, and just to make sure all of our panelists from the different countries are heard, I'd like to move to Sri Lanka. Uh, so, Chaminda, um, yes. <laughs> I think one of the things that we've seen in, in Sri Lanka is really massive inflation um, and uh, huge rises in, in prices of staple commodities and food, as well as rising debt, um, and as well as issues with the value chains in Sri Lanka being okay. broken and um, challenges with imports due to the war in Ukraine. Could you just talk uh, us through a little bit the, the challenges and situation of, of older people in the context and, and what you've seen in your research? Yes, uh, thank you, Shannon. Actually, as you mentioned, that Sri Lanka is facing a very big inflation uh, situation from the last year. Actually, it has gone more than 80%, and now it's uh, settled with some uh, around 50%.
29, 30% like that area. But it's again, it's uh, going and now some food items has gone uh, more than uh, triple, that means 300% um, more than the previous prices. And then uh, the older people face a very difficult situation how uh, they can access to the food item that some people are starving actually that they uh, can't uh, find uh, the one meal per day. So then um, uh, uh, another thing is that uh, the people, uh, our country production also gone down due to this uh, agriculture sector uh, 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 production losses uh, due to the no fertilizer and government has taken decision to uh, not import the chemical fertilizer. So then uh, the farmers don't know how to uh, lose this uh, organic one and how to uh, uh, create uh, within a very short period. So then uh, the agriculture production also lost the rice and uh, other uh, vegetable items also get affected. So then um, the other, uh, the pre uh, government has to um, uh, import those items so that also the uh, burden for the government uh, without having foreign exchange uh, to bring the essential food items and as well as the non-food items such as fuel and also other uh, medicine and other required items uh, to the country so then all Older people are most vulnerable at this situation and they uh, now even in the hospital there are many medicinal items also not in the hospital. So then medical service cost and other um, uh, medicinal item cost also gone uh, uh, high and then people can't bear that cost and therefore they have to go to some coping strategies like uh, some other people are using uh, uh, traditional medicines and go to the uh, Ayurvedic treatment or something and uh, village level what they found uh, from the herbal and they use but uh, they have stopped what they have continued with the western medicine so far so then uh, many people are at the risk and some uh, in the considering the fuel uh, prices gone up and uh, it is also gone up to uh, more than 300 percent what we had uh, taken before the crisis and then uh, the what happened was that uh, uh, other things that government don't had enough um, um, uh, foreign exchange to buy the food from the outside and uh, well from the outside then what uh, that uh, the lack of uh, sc scarcity of the poor in the country make uh, big queues and uh, uh, people uh, very uh, angry with that situation and older people face very difficulties in the transportations and even now uh, the government uh, now uh, introduced that QR codes and they uh, given some quota system uh, to issue the pool uh, but the prices are still high and then people can't afford uh, for this transport cost then uh, that normally even uh, our general public transportation systems also get, get crowded and people uh, tend to use uh, uh, general uh, transport systems and uh, public so and forth and uh, they reduce their private transportation system even in the uh, village level the older people use this uh, tuk tuk and some um, uh, local level transport vehicle but uh, that, that price also gone up and then help older people are facing difficulties to even transport to the hospital and also the market and other their day-to-day uh, -day needs uh, that is very difficult uh, situation they are facing now and then uh, due, uh, due to that uh, they are they have to work more distance uh, so another thing is that uh, they face the situation in uh, this kerosene oils and lp gas uh, because those prices also gone up and then they can't even cook and um, they have to face big challenge and now people are using firewoods that also uh, become another challenge of, of using that firewood with uh, more uh, airborne uh, more, more air pollutions and then 
that is uh, begin other uh, health issues and um, also uh, it's affect to the environment too and on the other hand that uh, we uh, the other health care and uh, prices also gone up and elder care services uh, also uh, facing big challenges at now that told the people unable to access that uh, elder care services and even the volunteer who uh, did these services also facing difficulties to uh, continue with, uh, in as a volunteer because of they also need money and they have to uh, find their own day-to-day uh, -day, uh, money expenditure for their life so then uh, um, this is also very uh, big challenge at this moment uh, and other um, thing is that older people are facing uh, elders uh, most elders are depend on these small scales livelihood because of uh, concerns in our country situations uh, as you say as you see that uh, only around 35 percent are getting some social uh, protection schemes but uh, those are also not enough uh, uh, because you know that elders getting who are about 70 years old uh, who there are no other means of income they get only uh, uh, 2000 uh, rupees that around uh, uh, less than uh, eight uh, dollars per day uh, then uh, per month that is uh, uh, not enough for, to fill, fulfill these their needs now so then uh, that uh, they face in difficult situations and uh, uh, they depend on mainly the small scale livelihoods and some labor work type of things but uh, the uh, the opportunity to sell these products and uh, uh, the uh, is a very low now because of the their market as uh, you say that value chain has dropped that they don't know market in the village level and then raw material as issues and also uh, uh, those days some of money People depend on the tourists and they wait for the foreigners to come to Sri Lanka and sell some product for them and provide services for them. Now that also has uh, been broken and uh, therefore the people, many people lost their livelihood activities and they, then the people uh, become more vulnerable. And the other hand, we go to uh, the agriculture sector, so with the fertilizer issue and uh, the other uh, input prices have been gone up especially like uh, fuel also that they can't use even tractors and that mechanical items in the uh, field due to the higher price and, um, and this uh, type of issues uh, faced by the elders as this uh, uh, the current scenario that uh, our uh, uh, natural uh, uh, disasters such as drought and also the uh, floods and other things also affected uh, to the old people lives change now uh, because of uh, now they are facing very big uh, economic challenges as well as they are getting this type of uh, uh, environmental pets so they can't uh, face these shocks at uh, once so this is a big challenges is coming and facing Sri Lankan elderly and uh, uh, therefore we need to have good uh, some concrete uh, social protection schemes uh, for the older people in Sri Lanka so we uh, push the government and also we uh, now the government also provided some uh, uh, allowances uh, during uh, 2000 uh, actually during 2020 uh, uh, to uh, with the, in the la last year for only three months they given uh, 500 uh, rupee uh, 5000 rupees they increases it to uh, 5000 rupees because now they are getting 2000 it is needed to 5000 uh, with the world bank support but uh, now it's not continuing but people need more than that. According to our estimate and the research finding, we need to provide more than uh, 10,000 or 15,000 for, uh, for the people uh, to at least sustain at, uh, this uh, crisis situation. And now, 
uh, during this year that uh, with the support of uh, IMF, uh, the country able to um, some catch up some sit some uh, sit uh, pos positive situation to uh, face now. But uh, the thing is that uh, we are still not paying the uh, big loans uh, getting from the different countries and the international uh, funding agencies. So if government is started to pay that, so they can't again uh, sustain uh, uh, this one and uh, uh, only with the foreign support only now uh, we are uh, controlling this some uh, extent uh, till now but uh, the current situation is now uh, the government is going to reduce the number of uh, show, uh, people getting uh, government uh, social uh, support schemes like uh, samurdi and elders uh, uh, allowances and other uh, poor people pro poor people are getting allowance that they now they are uh, shortlisting and um, people who are the most vulnerable but there are some issues with that system also uh, therefore uh, many people now become more vulnerable so then uh, uh, i think it in next year and this year uh, the very big challenge uh, as a country as all the people uh, who are living in the country they have to face many big challenges thank you chairman okay. that was a really good summary of i think the very complex situation and challenges that older adults face in sri lanka and mm -hmm. i think it, it does sound like the government is really making strides to increase the social protection coverage and amounts um, but perhaps it's not enough and, and not sustainable. Um, one question that we have from the audience is specifically how cash distribution and social protection impact the lives yes. of older women. And in particular, as it relates to yeah. um, family dynamics and, and decision making. Could you just speak briefly um, to, to yes. how social protection programming uh, is supporting women in Sri Lanka? Yes. Actually, the government uh, has some cash transfer programs and also some uh, NGOs also we practice uh, this type of cash transfer programs to the women. Actually, if, we, if they have money uh, uh, that uh, in the family systems, they got uh, some uh, empowerment because they have some decision making power, especially these older women, uh, they are not... Uh, uh, having a power in their family in the country situation but if uh, we are giving some money or even some uh, uh, that kind support so then the families uh, members are coming and they got some uh, decision making power and they again get their recognition in the family as well as in the society and actually that we have found many uh, studies uh, we are with our uh, uh, many uh, surveys that we have identified uh, the women's empowerment through these uh, cash transfer systems. But uh, in this some uh, uh, rare cases, we found that older women uh, who are more vulnerable uh, has uh, some uh, threatened also with the cash. If they have with the cash that sometimes that they are men or the uh, other uh, uh, relatives are uh, threaten them to get that cash and they ought to have some other things and uh, they, what they want to do. So, but uh, that is a very rare case, but mainly that uh, as an empowerment uh, of the women, uh, I also recommend uh, to do some cash transfer programs in the country. I think this also uh, related to other country also as a uh, developing and the uh, <laughs> Uh, also in the middle income countries, uh, this situation uh, is uh, the same. Thanks, Thanks. Shaminda, very much for that, that response. Um, I think that was a, a great segue. Um, and I'd like to move now to Emily Berdico, who's the 
from the Coalition of Services for the Elderly in the Philippines, because I think when you're speaking about middle income countries and, and social protection, um, the Philippines is a pretty good example. Um, so Emily, I was wondering maybe if you could just describe for us a little bit about the situation of older adults in the Philippines, and in particular, um, describe for us the social pension program and how it's effective and inclusive, and is it you know, adequately addressing the needs of older adults uh, during the combined crisis we've been seeing. Oh, yes, uh, thank you, Shannon. So here in the Philippines, uh, we have the social, yeah, the social pension program. It is being implemented by the Department of Social Welfare and Development since 2011. So it's 12 years already. Uh, unfortunately, the the current social pension program in the Philippines is not designed to address the, the needs of other people during uh, the crisis. So uh, the purpose of the current social pension program is to augment the daily subsistence and medical needs of indigent older persons. Besides, uh, this program has its limitations. So in terms of coverage and accessibility, the amount of benefits, timeliness of de delivery or the payout, and also the there is also some concerns about the eligibility criteria. So though the social pension program reaches a significant portion of the older population in the Philippines, uh, currently uh, in 2022, we have 3.8 million beneficiaries for the social pension program. This is the non-contributory pension. Uh, we have 3.8 million compared to other pension systems in the country, for example, from the government service insurance systems, which uh, we only have half million, like 525,000 beneficiaries. And from social security system, we only have around 2.9 million. Then we also have this Philippine Veterans Affairs uh, Office who are uh, providing pension to the veterans with the uh, 118, no, only 118,000 beneficiaries. However, if uh, when I uh, I said that the current social pension uh, has a compared to other pension has a large or uh, coverage or reaches a significant portion of the our population. Uh, the the amount is very small, like only 500 pesos per month or which is square, uh, equivalent to nine US dollar per month. So how much more during the times of like crisis, like the pandemic, like for example, the 3F crisis. So uh, the amount, this amount is not really sufficient no, to address the basic needs of older persons. And in terms of then when, for example, when there is a, the, the disasters or the pandemic or some of the economic uh, crisis, their vulnerability of the older persons may be heightened. So that that that, that includes the price of the basic commodities or high, uh, hikes, increase in medical needs and other issues of the older persons. Another thing is the social pension payout is being done once in every quarter or, in, or every six months and sometimes in other provinces especially in the remote areas we just receive it like once a year so considering the minimal amount and the delays of that in dispersing social pension it significantly affect uh in achieving the purpose in augmenting the daily needs of the older person so that is some of the uh issues concern uh, here in the Philippines of the current social pension program. So uh, we also have this, cons uh, the selection criteria is sub subjective. So uh, because the, the selection criteria, like uh, th those who are frail, sickly, or with disability and without pensions or permanent source of income or compensation or financial assistance from his or relatives to support his or uh, her basic needs. So, it this uh, criteria resulted in different interpretations, especially with the local government units, because there is no clear indicators no, in the criteria. If you say uh, no, uh, like 
minimal support or no support from the relatives without income, no permanent source of income. So it's not really clear. So, but on a positive note, we have some social safety net programs also in the Philippines uh, to reduce the impact of the crisis. Like, for example, we have the assistance to individuals in crisis situation, or we call it AX, that is being implemented by the Department of Social and Welfare in Development to provide aid to individuals, to families uh, seeking assistance, for example, for medical, funeral, food, transportation, even educational and other support services. However, there are still issues with the accessibility and eligibility of the criteria and also the documentary requirements, which somehow limit to older persons access the program. So, uh, for example, one of the requirements is a voter's ID. So it's something related also to if you are not a voter in that place, you cannot you know, you cannot access that services or that programs. So yeah, that's the 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 the, the situation of the current social pension in the country. Thank you, Emily. I think that was a really interesting and good overview. It was, I think, really different to hear that there's perhaps much broader coverage of the social protection scheme in the Philippines, but of course, not without its challenges in terms of, of targeting. And also, it sounds like the amounts um, are, are very small and, and inadequate to meet needs. Um, one of the questions that we have in the chat relates to um, how social protection schemes can be made more shock responsive and what are the main elements of shock responsive social protection. And I was wondering if you could perhaps talk a little bit about that uh, within the context of the Philippines. Uh, yes, yeah, so as I mentioned earlier, the current uh, social pension in the Philippines is not designed to, to be shock responsive. But I think uh, one of the key elements to really enhance the current social pension program is to uh, increase its uh, benefit level. So by increasing, because currently, as I mentioned earlier, we on, it is uh, only 500 pesos per month or 9 US dollar per, per, per month. And uh, other... Uh, and it should be, I think uh, there is a need to be, to have like a re, re, re strategizing of the current social protection program. For example, uh, we need to do, for example, contingency planning. Uh, we have to develop plans that outline specific measures to be taken during crisis. Then this plan should, you know, address how the social pension program will respond to different types of shocks such as natural disasters, economic downsters, and also health emergencies. So I think that is one. And I think another uh, strategy that we need to consider to enhancing the, to, to make the social pension more responsive and um, uh, shock, uh, shock responsive is to have a rapid assessment and targeting. So you have to establish mechanisms for rapid assessment and targeting during the crisis. So for example, this will involve the identification of the most vulnerable population and uh, prov rapidly providing social pension benefits to those who may be impacted the most. So maybe that is one also. And another thing, so we have to maybe make it flexible, uh, the, the benefit disbursement make it flexible uh, we have to create the create a flexibility in the disbursement of the social pension benefits during emergencies so so maybe that is one to be considered also and also another thing maybe last thing is about we can make it uh, the the payment because there is also problem in the delivery for the payout so make it digital Digital, uh, digital payment systems. So we have to utilize digital payment systems to ensure that time be and uh, secure your distribution of the social pension fund. So, so maybe that are one uh, that are some of the strategies I have in mind to make the social pension in the Philippines more shock responsive. And uh, the last thing is we I I mentioned already that we have this. Uh, um, assistance to individuals in crisis situations. So maybe 
we have also to review to enhance this current policies and to make it more accessible to older persons and other at risk groups. So that's all. Thank you. Thanks, Emily. I, I think those are a lot of really good ideas. Um, and I think challenging to implement, but but also feasible. And there's good examples from, from other countries where, where um, for example, electronic payments and more, more responsive um, programming has been implemented. Um, in the interest of time, I'd like to move to our last panelist, um, who's Do uh, Andrew Kavala, Executive Director for the Malawi Network of Older Persons Organizations. And, I, you know, in Malawi, I think we've really seen the impacts of the current crisis being exasperated by climate change, um, for example, the recent cyclone Freddie. And we wondered if you could give some perhaps examples of um, what those specific impacts have been, who's been most affected, um, and, and tell us just a little bit more about the, the details of the situation of older adults in Malawi. Uh, thank you so much, Andy. Good morning or good afternoon to everyone. Thank you for joining the webinar. Uh, as already mentioned, I'm Andrew Kavala. I'm from Malawi. And I'm happy uh, to share the impact of the food fuel uh, crisis in Malawi, as well as the most recent cyclone Fred, uh, which has been quite very devastating in the history of this country. And I think uh, the mammals are still quite very flesh and the uh, the, 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 the impact still remains quite very huge. So maybe I would, I would, I would briefly talk about uh, the impact of the 3F study in Malawi, uh, as already highlighted by Bob. And then I would now down to the second thread, quite very briefly, I know time is not on our side. But needless to say, uh, uh, a number of uh, major, major shocks in Malawi have disrupted the, our way of living. So you are looking at the COVID-19, uh, even the war uh, in Ukraine, Russia, Ukraine, and the recent cyclone as well. I think they have both compounded the challenges that we are going through as a country. Uh, just quite very briefly, I would say uh, a few findings uh, which came out during the 3F study uh, in Malawi. The study showed the, uh, the crisis has negative effects on others, other persons' well-being. Uh, for instance, 87% of those who were participants in the study confirmed that the, uh, their food security was in a deep crisis, uh, as well as the, 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 their income security uh, was, was high, heavily compromised in a number of ways. At the same time, uh, apart from just maybe talking about older persons, the study uh, found that the older women uh, were more affected, looking also at their level of responsibility at the community level. Let me mention here that the, in Malawi, over 40% of orphans uh, are being taken care of by older women. Why? Because the HIV and the AIDS pandemic has wiped out a generation, making older women parents again. Now, these older women have become parents again without any, uh, a stable, predictable source of income for them to take care of the orphaned children. So you would actually see that the uh, different situations which, have, which Malawi has gone through has eventually uh, made the older persons, specifically older women, uh, quite more vulnerable uh, than, than you would expect. At the same time, uh, the same study as well uh, showed that the uh, managing of uh, having food at the household level for most older persons has been an issue. So uh, a quite, quite a good number of participants in the study indicated that the uh, they were either having a, a single meal a day, or in some cases, going even without a meal. And it's a nightmare even to think of having the basic necessities like somebody, somebody uh, would want to have under normal circumstances. And even the study uh, indicated that the, uh, 
say those in the rural communities having managed having the potential to manage say the the, the paraffin which is used for lightening uh, was an issue as well meaning to say uh, they were they are forced to live in darkness even in the evening because they can't afford the basic paraffin to light their lamps so generally uh, the study really found that the, uh, the situation for other persons in Malawi uh, is quite very dire and the, requiring a lot of intervention if people have to live back to their normal lives. However, now coming to the issue of the cyclone fraid, uh, I want to mention here that the, the cyclone fraid, the tropical cyclone fraid in Malawi uh, has caused the, the havoc beyond the, our expectation. I think as a country, we are still living in shock. We have had the, uh, a number of cyclones before, uh, but they would come go maybe 20, 30 people affected or killed in the process. But the tropical cyclone Fred, uh, I think it came at the time when everybody thought, yes, one of those cyclones which come and go uh, with very minimal or manageable effects. While this cyclone Fred in Malawi, I think it was a rude awakening uh, to Malawians because people wake up in the morning and the, all they are seeing or hearing is that uh, this whole village has been swept away. Or in that district, five villages have been swept away. And when we are talking about a village being swept away, we're not talking about a hundred of people, but the whole village, including buildings and people, all swept away. Now, the cyclone fraid had come at the time when the maize was, maize is our staple food in Malawi. So the cyclone fraid hit Malawi at the time when uh, the maize was at the level of maturation. People were about to start harvesting, and that's the time the cyclone fraid came. And the, almost all the 11 districts which were affected in the southern part of Malawi, the, the entire maize was swept away. So you actually seeing that when a country that already is grappling with the, uh, the effects of COVID-19, uh, the Russia-Ukraine war, where at some point the price of cooking oil in Malawi had moved from five liters, had moved from uh, five dollars five, $5, for argument's sake to about $25. That's how terrible it became at some point in time. Uh, fuel had gone up. So it, it, we are looking at the getting the, going, say, going to the bakery, going anywhere else to buy food when the cooking oil and other ingredients had gone so high, life was unattainable. Now the, the cyclone phrase uh, came at a time when people were saying, now we, at least we can have a bit of maize and the, for, for, for God's sake, uh, Malawi was going to have a bumper harvest uh, this year because the men's was behaving very well, the rains were behaving very well, but all that swept away. So that already uh, has just facilitated the, uh, how in, in, into a waste scenario for other persons. Uh, our recent uh, assessments, even the assessments done by the Say, say, say by the government department of Food disaster management affairs and other agencies in Malawi showed that over 45,000 households for older men and older women were affected. And when we moved around the camps, it was quite very clear, life was terrible. Now the issue is how are these going to go back and start life again in a country where uh, we have the social card transfer uh, and our social credit transfer in Malawi is 90% donor funded. Uh, so, uh, and the social credit transfer in Malawi targets 10% of the ultra poor and labor constrained households uh, in every district. So, other persons, though uh, some of them are part of the beneficiaries for the program. The, the, the targeting is not directed to other persons. So they are targeted by default because it is targeting labor constrained and, and, and ultra poor and labor constrained households. So other persons benefit by default. And the, when you also look at the, the other persons benefiting from the country's transfer program, uh, you would actually see that the, 
it is a nightmare. And the level of responsibility that they have, even if they are only welfare and dignity. Uh, so generally uh, in Malawi, the, the, the rising prices, the, the increase in the, in the prices for the basic commodities and the cyclone freight in the, in the last few months has actually made the lives of older men and older women more dire and the, uh, in a critical need uh, for, 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 for tailor-made social protection scheme to ensure that uh, we are able to bring their life to, 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 the, to their dignity. Other than that, I think life is something else. Let me stop there for the meantime. Thank you very much, Andrew. That was, I think, a, a really saddening situation um, to, to learn about, and particularly the impacts of Cyclone Freddy. Um, one of the questions I have and that I'm seeing in the chats relates to specifically help age programming for older adults beyond, you know, beyond policy, but what you're doing in the communities. And I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit more about the specific needs of older women, people with disability, displaced populations, or those that lost their maize crop, and, and what help age programming in for those populations looks like. Thank you so much. Uh, indeed, as, as, as one of the network members for Help Work International, uh, we have always been supported by Help Work International, uh, sometimes even joint programming. Uh, for the cyclone fred victims, uh, uh, help which uh, supported us to tap resources uh, from the Global Emergency Fund, GEF, and uh, we provided the, uh, both food uh, and, and food items to uh, a number of older persons headed households just to ensure that uh, we are able to bring a bit of sanity in their households. So we did a lot of distribution for food and then food items. Uh, and and even if, if, even before the second fred, we also had the, a social cash transfer program uh, where we distributed, although it was the once off, but we distributed the cash uh, according to the food basket uh, requirements to a number of other other persons headed households. Uh, let me also mention that the, during the COVID nineteen situation. Uh, government and the development partners had also a specific uh, transfer package uh, for those who were deemed to be seriously affected. And we were part of the institutions which supported with the identification of beneficiaries. So uh, more older persons were part of that, uh, of, the, of those transfers, though they were only for six months. So generally, there have been a number of uh, some efforts uh, taking place, but uh, these are uh, once off kind of, and usually in, in, in a situation like Malawi, where over 90% of the population is living uh, below the $1 uh, poverty, it, the once off uh, do not seem to work as much as we'd want. So I think we'd, we'd be looking forward to a more stable, more, predict, more predictable, more secure uh, social protection initiative, which would eventually be able to restore the dignity, welfare of other persons. Thank you, Andrew. Um, I think I would like to move to some of the more general questions and, and open the floor to all of the different panelists to respond. Um, one of the questions from the audience was how the analysis of this study and the lessons learned can be replicated, um, in particular in relation to, to advocacy components. Um, and if you have any examples um, or ideas for how to increase coverage of, I think, social protection programming um, for, for older adults in these settings. So I don't know if any of you would like to speak uh, from your experience there, but, but I think increasing coverage clearly is, is a big challenge um, that, that needs to be addressed. So, yeah, I will uh, respond to the question. So, based in uh, our experience in the Philippines, yeah, increasing the coverage is really a challenge. 
Though since uh, the social pension program started in 2011, it has only the beneficiaries were still small, like less than a million, like, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's less than a million. And now after 12 years, it's already uh, 3.8 million. So so it is because through the continuous advocacy of, uh, of our organization, you know, partner or the person's organization. So it can currently, uh, apart from increasing the, uh, the, the number of beneficiaries, we're also uh, pushing to make it universal. So since 2016, we are like... Uh, advocating to make it universal unfortunately until now it is not being approved but, but uh, apart from increasing the uh, uh, apart from making it universal we are also um advocating to increase the the benefit level like from 500 pesos to 1500 there is a current uh bill both in the uh, house of representatives and in the senate and now I think it's in the table of the president already, uh, already president of the Philippines. Uh, but the it's only increased the benefits from 500 to 1,000. Uh, but it is not yet universal. So that's the our uh, experience here in the Philippines. But even that increase in benefits is not yet assigned by the president. So it's not yet approved. So yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I just I just want. Go ahead. Sorry. Uh, go ahead. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Bob. I I just wanted to add uh, one more uh, additional point on what has been said by Emily, uh, especially uh, regarding the productive safety net program. Uh, it's currently, you know, uh, supported by uh, direct assistance by uh, like uh, mainstream donors. In our case. Uh, probably the government of UK, the United States. So I think it's very important to diversify the source, uh, the funding source uh, for this uh, uh, program uh, and also start, you know, um, uh, national domestic initiatives to involve uh, private sector and uh, uh, other uh, sectors as well to make it more sustainable, more robust, and also uh, more inclusive, which covers uh, those who really need uh, the service. Thank you. Thanks, Chiminda. I saw that you are unmuted. Did you want to come in? Or if not, Bob? Uh, no, <laughs> no, no. No, okay. Then, Bob, over to you. Okay, so in that case, um, I thought I would just also give the audience an idea about how Health Age International operates um, in terms of our advocacy and policy influencing. So, just to complement what my, what my colleagues from the Philippines and Ethiopia mentioned about their country level activities. So the way Help Age works is we support country partners in their policy influencing and advocacy. And uh, our work is very much driven by what they find as priorities for their countries. Um, and we would support them with capacity building um, as well as uh, con 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 uh, convening support in terms of bringing them into larger networks and bringing different actors together to to um, to help them with their their particular initiatives. And um, so, once the question is about you know what do we do after these um, after we have the findings of this the study, I would say that um, our current agenda is very much driven by the lessons we learned from the the COVID nineteen crisis as well as from the food and finance um, food uh, food fuel finance crisis. Um, in a sense that what, what is really clearly coming out from those both crises is, um, as I mentioned in my presentation, the importance of social protection systems. Um, and what we saw during COVID-19 is precisely that's what was happening in countries that had strong social protection systems were able to, uh, to, to support their population affected by COVID better. And countries they did not have um, institutional arrangements that were in place they actually 
uh, introduce temporary measures to 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 extend coverage to um, um, to increase the value of benefits, uh, introduce um, some you know new innovative arrangements to support the populations, and therefore we're able to help the population to cope. Therefore, these are lessons that are very very important, and we're totally embracing them in the sense that we would like to um, uh, to promote the need for social protection for all. Um, and the need for social protection that is shock responsive and social protection that is gender responsive. Um, and this is something that we are, we strongly believe in and we carry out, um, currently we are working on some knowledge products that would, um, help us communicate our, um, our thinking and our, uh, our experiences in a much more sort of evidence based manner. Um, and, uh, and and to also develop strategies to support um, country partners to uh, to promote those agendas within those frames. Great, thanks, Bob. I, I think that was a really good summary. Um, and I think we may have time for for one more question. Um, and Bob, this question was directed to you, and it's related to the real current event of phasing out the grain deal and how you see um, food needs changing um, as a result of that, potentially. I don't know if you can look into your crystal ball. Um, specifically, they were interested in the metric tons that might be needed to serve um, the, the population in Africa. But, but I think maybe more generally, just if you could speak to how you think the phasing out the grain deal will, will impact older populations going forward. Because I think a lot of us are concerned about that. Yeah, absolutely. No, that's a that, that's an important question. I think there are, there are some forecasts coming out at, as we speak because the the uh, Russia suspension of the grain deal was uh, announced a few weeks ago, and there's now um, so we, we we sort of get to see the responses from different organizations and governments, and and there are, there is an alarm um, and 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 anxiety about what can happen. And and I and in in preparing this for this presentation, I mean I digged out a few. Um, statistics uh, or forecasts um, that are, as well as um, some uh, facts that can help sort of contextualize the situation. So, so for you to, to understand the scale of it, of these, um, so 80% of um, Africa's grain is dependent on uh, imports from, uh, from, from Ukraine and Russia. And these are especially, you know, countries in East Africa who are, um, uh, who are heavily um, import dependent, uh, export dependent. Now, what happens is that through the Black Sea grain deal, there was about 33 million tons of grain that was allowed to exit uh, Ukrainian ports. So think about the numbers, 33 million tons was allowed to exit. Now, with closing those gates, you would have um, a, a vast um, you know, number of um, people in demand of grain, essential staples, uh, not receiving them because they're largely dependent on grain coming out from the Black Sea. And so looking at the, the, the forecast, so for example, I mentioned East Africa, uh, and this is the region that is particularly affected by climate. Um, so the, the, the latest forecast that there will be 40 million people in the region in need of food, experiencing extreme food insecurity. So, so such as the, um, the the gravity of the, um, the the passage through the Black Sea, um, and uh, so I can I can I, I can pay, paste the link in the chat um, from um, for you to be able to see uh, more um, details about you know the the effects of this. That's from the International Rescue Committee. So that's um, that's what I can share with you at the moment. Thanks, Bob. I, I think that was really insightful, um, and I think you know, unfortunately, just really gives us great pause as to the the needs and how they're going to be rapidly growing um, in the future, both as a as a result of the grain deal, but also climate change and the increasing scale of the humanitarian emergencies worldwide. So I think we as a community definitely have our work cut out for us um, in terms of how we support older adults going forward. Um, unfortunately, we are at time, but I would really like to thank everyone for making the, the time in your busy schedules to join us today. Um, I hope that you enjoyed the session.
Uh, as a follow-up, we will share the slides, the speaker bio information, um, as well as a brief survey. Um, so you can give us feedback on the session and we would greatly appreciate that as uh, so we know how to do better in the future. Um, but thank you again for joining and um, we look forward to staying in touch and um, best of luck. Uh, in all of your programming and, and policy efforts, because um, I think collectively we can see from today they're they're very much needed. So thank you, everyone, and have a good rest of the day. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Bye.